the and that's what we are waiting for. Good evening. My name is Joy Galbraith and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth installment of our Building a Strong Financial Foundation Fortitude Fridays. This evening, we are going to be focusing on understanding long-term care insurance. We want to thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for being with us for all of the uh, installments in this series. Um, we appreciate your your presence this evening. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Pansy Davis. Thank you. Good evening again, everyone. Thank you for dialing in to this very uh, important discussion. Uh, tonight, we're going to um, have our own Angelina McCarthy Bryan to, to provide us an, um, an overview about um, about, uh, oh goodness, about, about long-term care and also give you an opportunity to ask questions. So Angelina will go through the presentation and then we will end um, at 7.30. And after that, we will give you an opportunity to ask questions via the chat. If you have questions, go ahead and put it in the chat. And at the end, we will read those questions and Angelina will um, respond to your questions. Angelina McCarthy Bryan is an MBA. It, she has her MBA and is a financial service professional, licensed agent, executive counsel 2019, and a $2016 million round table member, which means she's recognized among the top 1% of financial services professionals in the world. Mrs. Bryan runs her own financial practice with New York Life Insurance Company and specializes in an array of financial areas, among them life insurance, annuities, investments, long-term care insurance, retirement planning, college planning, and grandparent gifting. Mrs. Bryan's ongoing goal is to educate, empower, and help her clients create their own financial peace of mind. She's, her conference calls are tailored specifically for her clients. And as such, a full understanding of where each client stands financially enables her to provide applicable solutions for their financial goals. Mrs. Bryan is providing an opportunity to schedule a free financial consultation for a future date, should you desire to discuss your financial needs one-on-one. -on -one. She looks forward to sharing how she may be assistance to you. And with no further ado, Angela McCarthy Bryan. Thank you so much, Soror Pansy, for that introduction. Welcome everybody to our fourth series in our financial understanding and building of uh, financial awareness. And tonight's conversation is as exciting as all of our other conversations have been. And we are going to be discussing understanding long-term care insurance. So without further ado, we're going to take a look at a slideshow and then we're going to proceed from there. Okay, so we're going to give you a little brief synopsis of what we have been doing and what has led us to where we are today. So right now, we are going to go through the understanding long-term care insurance for tonight's conversation. But we're gonna take a look back at our series because the series has been an exciting one. We have come away with a wealth of knowledge and information as it pertains to building a very strong financial household. So if we take a look at our last, or really I should say our first seminar, we looked at focusing in on using fundamental principles to create our own blueprint for a, a successful financial future. So with that, we uncovered understanding how to build a strong financial household and what that entails. 
Moving on from there, we also had a great session about building generational wealth. We brought on Douglas Easy, and we also brought on Eugene Mitchell, both authors and very well esteemed. They were able to share with us some great understanding about generational wealth and legacy building and how to proceed going forward. In addition to that, our third session, we brought on Amy Griffin, who is an attorney and she was able to share with us estate planning. We looked at areas that uncovered understanding wills, trusts, medical directives, um, and also power of attorneys. So it was an exciting conversation that we had in our third series. And of course, tonight we're gonna head right into understanding long-term care. So first your thought may be, what does long-term care have to do with building a strong financial household? Well, that is a great question. And I can tell you that sometimes we overlook long-term care because we assume we have everything else taken care of, but it is an area that you absolutely should not forget to cover in your strong financial portfolio. Because if you do, it could become very costly to you in the future. So we always wanna keep in mind that our household should be built and should be built strong. The information I'm providing you here is my information. Again, should you desire a need to understand more, to dive deeper into your own finances and look at the areas that you have planned well in and some maybe some gaps in financial planning, please feel free to reach out to me directly. My information is noted here. I run my own financial business with New York Life. In addition to that, my address is located there for my business. And of course, my phone number and my email. You may feel free to call the office or send me an email and I look forward to assisting you as I am willing to provide a free financial consultation to you that would be helpful for you to uncover what's necessary for yourself and for your future. This information is important to let you know, this is an informational and insurance uh, sales presentation. The reason we're stating this here is that again, you are to consult with your tax advisor, your legal professional, your accounting professional before making any decisions. And again, the sole focus of this presentation is for informational purposes and not for any solicitation of any items or purchase or sales. So this particular screen is important because we started here. This is talking about, again, thinking about your finances as a house. So when we first began our journey, we looked at cash flow and net worth, understanding that in more detail. We looked at risk management. We looked at college funding and retirement planning. And we also looked at wealth accumulation. So tonight's conversation, you may be wondering where does long-term care fall in the midst of our financial household? Well, it is now going to be taking a look at risk management. You might be wondering why risk management? Why would it fall here? Well, imagine if you were building a home and let's just say that you built the foundation, you had a great blueprint, but you forgot to put the roof on top of the house. Then the question would be, is it really a home? Is it really protected from the, from the weather, from ailments, from things that could occur because there's no roof? So again, our thought is that we don't wanna build a house and not have it fully completed. So taking a look here, this is gonna share with you emergency funds. So why is this important? Because sometimes if we are not prepared for an emergency, we may end up having a circumstance that will lead us unaware, unprepared, and we will have a lot of financial burden. And long-term care is gonna fall right into this. It's almost like a little protection, if you will, for yourself, and this is why. So moving on from here, we're going to take a look to understand that in that risk management also falls into place life insurance. Now, long-term care insurance is different from life insurance and we're going to uncover exactly why. Life insurance, as we've discussed previously, it is to be there to provide a death benefit. It is to be there to help with burial expenditures. It is to be there to help with generational wealth and legacy building. 
But most importantly, depending on what type of life insurance you have, you may have the ability to have cash value growth. And cash value growth is monies that are within the policy that you have the potential to borrow from. And you can use that money for any purpose, whether it be for your retirement planning, whether it be for long-term care needs in the future, or whether it be for college expenditures and the like. So the thought is life insurance can be used for many, many factors. The factors are what you determine is important to you. However, long-term care is going to dive into a completely different area that, again, is important in your financial portfolio. And taking a look here, what about long-term care? Why is it so important? What is the focus? What is the purpose? Well, this is important as a statistic. So 70% of people turning age 65 can expect to use some form of long-term care during their lives. Now, I must add that when we discuss the focus of age, know that it doesn't mean you have to be 65 years old in order for long-term care to kick in. There may be many needs that come up for any age group, not just at 65. So when should you really be considering long-term care? You may be surprised to know that you should be considering long-term care as early as in your 20s. Now, a lot of people will wonder, my goodness, well, I'm not planning on using long-term care in my 20s, so why in the world would I have a policy in my 20s? Well, the thought process is that you want to capitalize on how young and how healthy you are. Now, why is that important? Because as we age, policies become more expensive. So in order to capitalize on your current age, which technically you are at your youngest age right now, as we cannot age backwards. So the thought is that since I can't age backwards, let me go ahead and capitalize on my age and my health right now. Because as I get older, I'm not sure what ailments will befall me and I'm not sure what will occur. So again, planning is always key. Let's take a look at our next slide here. So moving on into this slide, it specifically says when you're focusing in on long-term care insurance, know the facts. So designed to cover long-term care services and support, including personal and custodial care in a variety of settings, whether it be your home, your community organizations, other facilities, policies can reimburse policyholders up to a pre-selected limit for services to assist them with activities of daily living. And there are an array of different options that can fit most price points. So again, you don't have to have everything covered, but having some things covered is highly important. Because again, if you don't have something covered, then that means you're going to have to cover everything on your own. And that can become very expensive, especially when you're looking at what you would like your future funds for your retirement to look like. So let's go ahead and take a look here. Why create a long-term care plan? One, you wanna take control over your care, the location and the provider. You wanna be in the seat, the driver's seat. Two, you wanna maximize the time at home if you need care. So you wanna be able to say, you know what? I want my care at my home and I want everyone to come in and take care of me as opposed to me having to go out and live in a nursing home or potentially a, a, an assisted living facility. So again, you're taking over that control by having a policy. And this is considered your own private policy. You wanna protect your retirement. So you have worked long and hard. And what happens if you don't plan or don't have a long-term care policy in place, you may have to liquidate that hard-earned retirement assets, your legacy that you have set for generations to come. And you may have to use that to take care of yourself. You may get long-term care to protect your family. Again, going back to that generational wealth and legacy building. I don't want to use the legacy monies that I have set aside for my family and generations to come and use that for myself. I may want to protect that. And your long-term care policy has the potential to protect your assets depending on the type of plan that you have. And most importantly, 
there is nothing better than a peace of mind. What type of peace of mind? A financial free peace of mind because it's priceless. And this can provide you with that. So I wonder if you all have ever thought about what is known as specifically activities of daily living. Now, when you get up in the morning, you get up, you eat on your own, you dress on your own, you bathe on your own, you transfer on your own, getting in and out of a bed or getting in and out of a chair, you use the facilities on your own, toileting on your own, and you have your continence. Now, the only time that doesn't happen is if you have an ailment, you're unable to formulate and do these things on your own, or potentially if you're a child or you're an elderly individual, or you might've had an accident and something has become and befallen you and you now cannot do these activities on your own. So if you're unable to do these activities, specifically two or more of these activities, then you are able potentially, if you prove, to have your long-term care policy pay for someone to come in and provide those services for you. Now, one of the things here, these are the six. So remember, the activities of daily living, we said are six eating, dressing, bathing, transferring, toileting, and continence. So moving on from here, you're all able to do these things on your own. It's a normal part of what you do every day. But sometimes long-term care may be needed as part of a treatment. What if, God forbid, you get in an accident and now you're unable to do these activities? You may be in your 20s, you may be in your 30s, you may be older but it may not necessarily be because you're at a 65, 70 or 80 year old individual. This may become a refall you sooner than you expected or anticipated due to an accident or any other means that could befall you. Moving on from there, when we take a look at understanding our plan, I will add as a part of the six, there is something also called cognitive impairment. There are two associations here, if you will, with cognitive impairment. And those are Alzheimer's and dementia. So if you're unable to do the activities of daily living, those again are two out of the six. If you're unable to do that, your long-term care policy can be utilized to pay for those care needs. But if you have a cognitive impairment, just one, Alzheimer's or dementia, then your long-term care policy can assist. Because again, you may be able to do all of the six activities of daily living, but if you have Alzheimer's or dementia, you may not recall or remember how to do them on your own. So again, the plan can be used to pay for the care needs you need when it comes to your activities of daily living. So let's take a look at these four areas here. It says, what's your plan? Specifically, who would provide your long-term care if you needed it? Where do you want to receive your care? How would you pay for your care? And what are the solutions? And what solution would you implement? So again, if you've never thought of these questions, they are very important trigger questions to understand. A lot of times we just say, well, I do these things on my own, but what if you could not? A lot of times you'll hear married couples, they'll tell me, well, Angelina, my husband will take care of me or my wife will take care of me. But what if it's a circumstance where unfortunately you're both the same age, you may end up being older and now it's very difficult to, for example, maybe change your spouse when you're 70, 80, 90, depending on what's going on with yourself. So you may have the desire to take care of your spouse or an individual, but you might not be able to, depending on what's happening with you. Have you ever asked yourself, where do I want to receive my care? Will it be in my home? Do I want to go to a nursing home? Do I want to go to assisted living facility? These are things you really need to think about. And how am I going to pay for my care? Is it going to be from my investments, my savings, my income? Is it going to be from my retirement? So these are questions you need to have in place and ask these questions and answer them for yourself. And what is the solution? What can I do in order to take care of my care needs? So again, who would you want to provide your care? Now, if I were to ask every one of you all, would you provide that care to your spouse? 
more than likely you would say yes. Now, what if it's a circumstance where you're not married and maybe you are a father and the father has only a daughter? Is the daughter going to want to, for example, bathe her father? Is she going to want to clean up or help him with toileting? These things may seem like, well, you know, I'm sure I'll do that. But the thought is that it's hard. Maybe he's uncomfortable or she's uncomfortable performing those duties. So the question then becomes, well, then who is going to perform those duties? Do we have enough money to pay for someone to perform those duties? And if so, how are we going to pay for that? Will it be, again, from the investments, from our savings, from our retirement? What are we going to do? And where does the long-term care take place? Now, we already talked about our home. I can tell you that the majority of individuals would prefer to be at their home. Why? Statistics show us that individuals who go into long-term care facilities, they generally stay for about 2.9 years, which is, let's just round it up and say three years. So if they're in a nursing home for three years, most of them after three years, they may not be with us any longer. What we have found is statistically, when you're in your own surroundings, surrounded by those that you love, in your familiar bed or your familiar surrounding, you are more comfortable. And because you're more comfortable, you generally have a more excited atmosphere. You are excited about the future. You have more hopes and dreams and desires because you're at home, you're being taken care of. So you potentially will live outlive that 2.9 year statistic, right? So that's the thought why most people would prefer to have the care at home. So again, your home, your community, assisted living facility, nursing home, these are options. But one thing that we all don't take into consideration is that if you don't plan, you may not be able to determine or decide where your care is going to be. And we're going to get into that. We will be discussing Medicare and Medicaid and what a lot of individuals believe and some misconceptions. So it's important for us to uncover that and to understand why planning is very fundamental. So this is the key question a lot of individuals ask. How much does long-term care cost? Well, the answer to that is it depends. It depends on the options that you choose. It depends on the inflation that you have. It depends on the daily cost of care that you are implementing. And at the end of the day, it also depends on if you are planning by yourself or if you're planning with your spouse. And additionally, who gets approved? Because there are certain discounts that can be implemented and can be affected in the plan, depending upon who is applying and who gets approved. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at some hypothetical illustrations. So before we take a look at these hypothetical illustrations, I want to go ahead and just take a little bit of a summary on what we have spoken about so far. So understand that long-term care insurance is not the same as life insurance. Long-term care insurance is being used to pay for the cost of your care needs. If you are unable to do the activities of daily living, and we discussed that there were six activities of daily living. And those activities, if we're unable to do two or more of those activities, then the policy can kick in, if approved, and pay for the cost of the care. Now, if you have a cognitive impairment, we said dementia or Alzheimer's, just by having one of those, your, your life insurance policy would not affect that, but your long-term care policy would, and you would be able to utilize that again to pay for the cost of care. Now, we talked about why life insurance is important. You can use some of the benefits within your life insurance policy to pay for long-term care if you desire to do that. But this policy is specific for the long-term care needs. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing here and I'm going to dive into some numbers. Now, the numbers I'm gonna share with you, again, are going to be specific to where you reside and the state that you're in. I'm going to specifically talk about Virginia for just a moment. Now in Virginia, the average cost of care, it may surprise you, is about $298 a day. Now that may not seem like a lot of money, but it actually adds up. If you're thinking about the cost of care in a nursing home, 
being potentially $298 a day. Let's just say that there's an average of 30 days in a month. So when you start doing that math and you say, okay, well, let's take 298 a day and multiply that by 30 days. So our number would be about a little over $8,940, okay? If we take that and we multiply that by 12, so there's 12 months in a year, that gives us about $107,280 to be exact. Now we said that most individuals are in a nursing home for how many years? 2.9 years, rounded up to three years, right? So we take that number, multiply that by three, and that's gonna give us about $321,840 in three years. Now, a lot of individuals make six figures, that's nice, but not everyone. Can you imagine if you're the caretaker for an individual who did not plan, now you're trying to figure out where are we gonna find this $321,000 figure, where's it coming from? How are we gonna pay for it? And a lot of people don't understand that caregivers, caregivers generally tend to be younger individuals. You might be statistically, it shows that roughly around the age of 45 or younger. Why is that? Because we may be caring for our parents who are older and so you may end up not realizing that you might not need long-term care now, but you've now become a caregiver to someone else who does. Now also you are maybe in charge of that individual's care. So now you have to determine what are we going to use? How are we going to use it? Where are we gonna pay for this? What are we gonna do? Am I going to quit my job to take care of you? Or am I going to pay an individual to come in to take care of you? Now, did you all realize that the average cost of care in this area can actually range between $25 to $50 an hour. An hour, that's a lot. Now, when you take that into consideration, the question is, okay, well then I can't afford someone to come in the house. I'm going to have to potentially quit my job. And now I'm gonna become a caregiver to an individual who may be a family member or a spouse. Now, why is this important? The statistics show us that 75% of caregivers, 75% of them are uncompensated female family members. Does that surprise you? Probably not. I see a lot of heads, nope. Now, did we get that uncompensated part? So that means that here she was, she might've had a career. She has her own family. And all of a sudden, mom or dad needs to have care. Now we may have to say, I've got to quit my job because we didn't plan. So now I've got to go back and take care of mom or dad. Now, what happens to her career? What happens to her status, her standing? What if she's a single mother? What if she's a single individual? I mean, we have to factor all that in. Not planning isn't something we can just do. It's a conscious decision to not plan, but know that it does affect the people that you say you love the most. So you have to take that into consideration. Without a plan, then you have planned to, you, you basically plan to fail. And that's just not acceptable. And so you have to keep that in mind because again, what are we here to do? These sessions are to plant a seed, to promote your understanding, to do something, make a change, talk to someone. If nothing else, get the information for someone else, if not for you. And at the end of the day, you may need long-term care. So this may factor into what you're going to need down the road. So let's go ahead and take a look at now some hypothetical illustrations. Now, why do I say hypothetical? Because this is not gonna necessarily pertain to you. And on top of that, you may not go with an option like this, but this is why having that free financial consultation is so important. Why? So that you have the ability to be able to understand how this works and what you can do. So we're gonna take a look at this together. Here's our first hypothetical illustration. So I have used a couple. This couple is called one John Jones and his wife, Judy Jones. Now let's just say these individuals are both the exact same age, 50 and 50. So why am I bringing this up? Now with long-term care, you may be interested to know 
that women pay more than men when it comes to long-term care insurance. Now, I wonder if anybody's wondering why that is. Well, the reason women pay more than men in long-term care in this type of scenario anyway, is because women statistically tend to live longer than males do. That means that more than likely we are going to be utilizing long-term care longer than a male would. And on top of that, if you are married, if you are married, statistics show that one or both of you may live into your 90s. So with that shared, if you're a female, more than likely it may be you that's living into that later age category. So why is that important? Well, it flips with life insurance. So ladies, if you get a life insurance policy and you and your husband are the exact same age, he will pay more for life insurance if he's the same health as you. And the reason why is because generally speaking, males pass away sooner than females do. So that means a benefit will be paid out sooner. So he's going to pay more for that benefit. So it works both ways. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look here. So we do not know the underwriting class. We're going to say preferred. Now, how does an individual know what rating they are? You take an application, you go through the underwriting process, your medical records are reviewed by a medical underwriter. If blood and urine is needed, then it will be taken, the labs will be reviewed, and then a decision will be made. Now let's take a look right here. I'm gonna do a little bit of highlighting here. So here we see 25%. So with this policy, you will receive 25% discount if you and your husband apply together and you both get approved. Now, if one of you get approved and the other one does not, there's still a minor discount, usually about 10% or so for the one spouse who got approved. But again, it will depend on the plan. Let's go ahead and take a look at this example. So applicant one is gonna be John and applicant two is going to be Judy. Now, if you can see my arrow going on right here, you'll be able to see that this says daily benefit. So we're looking at about $298 a day. I'm just giving you the average. Now, why is this important to note? You don't have to get a $298 a day policy. Having something is better than nothing. So when we take a look at this example, Remember we talked about the benefit period. The benefit period I said was about three years, 2.9 years to be exact. So basically this calculation shows us that the total value of this policy is about $326,310 for both John and Judy. Now there's a waiting period right underneath that. It says 90 days. What does that even mean? Well, 90 days specifically just says if the individual were to have a long-term care need, that individual, and if they were approved, that individual would have to cover the cost of care for the first 90 days before their policy would kick in. But there is an exception to the rule. Now, I know we have some amazing registered nurses on our line here. And the reason I say that is because our registered nurses are what we consider our care coordinators. Your policy will come with a care coordinator, depending on what policy you have. Now, the care coordinator is an individual who will come in to assess your care needs. If you were unable to do those activities of daily living, if we recall, we said two or more, or if you have a cognitive impairment, by you utilizing the care coordinator, that will reduce your waiting period from 90 days down to 20 days. So what does that mean? It means that for the first 20 days, you'll cover the cost of care. And after that, your policy will kick in and your policy will then on day 21, start paying for your care needs. Now there are different inflation options. The one underneath here says CPIU offers. What does that mean? It stands for Consumer Price Index. So offers means that every single year you would receive a notice from, in this case, New York Life saying, would you like to increase your daily benefit? If you increase your daily benefit, that will increase your policy lifetime maximum. So your $298 a day would go up and also your policy lifetime maximum, that $326,000 figure that will go up based upon the consumer price index of that year. Now you may be thinking to yourself, oh, you know what? I think everything will stay the same, but I can tell you the cost of care goes up. 
So again, that means people are being, you know, you're, you're more spending more for an individual to come into your home. They're charging more per hour. Uh, medical supplies are getting more expensive. So all of these things are happening. Now, moving on from here, let's go ahead and take a scroll down. So when we take a look here, there is a partner's, partner's benefit rider. And on top of the partner's benefit rider, there's a shared care rider. What does this mean? If you are a couple, this would not apply if it's an individual. If it's a couple, then the partner's benefit rider, what that means is that ultimately, if you have the ability for one of you to qualify for that waiting period. So the husband, in this case, John, he has waited the 20 days, he's qualified for that. So automatically, Judy is qualified now. She doesn't have to go back and wait the 20 days. She's been satisfied the 20 days because her husband satisfied her, okay? Now the shared care rider, this is important. So remember, there's a pool of money that's John's. John gets his own policy. There's a pool of money that's Judy's. Judy gets her own policy. And then there's a third bucket of money. This bucket will look identical to the policies you see here, but either John or Judy can now use that third bucket of money. So say John uses all of his 326,000, he now needs to still have long-term care needs. He can now go into that shared care rider bucket and use that money in order to take care of his care needs. So that's basically a third pile of money that is identical to his original policy that is there for his care needs. Now I'm scrolling down a little bit here. Take a look at these numbers. All I want you to focus on is the total premium right across here. So here it's saying that, well, it's $273.61 for John. It's $356.94 for Judy. Now we said this is because it's a $298 a day benefit. So it may seem a little bit high, but let's go ahead and scroll on down here. This is the exact same policy with an exception. The daily benefit is $150. Why am I showing you this? Because there are options. So this is the same exact concept, but we're using $150 a day instead of $290 a day. Now, if we do that, you can see right here, the whole policy lifetime maximum, what happened? It's now $164,250. Why am I saying that? Because why the policy can fit any need. So again, this is an individual doing exactly the same as our option one did, with the exception that we reduce the daily benefit down to $150 a day for both John and Judy. Now take a look here, what happens to their monthly benefit? Well, the monthly premium that they're paying will go down. So John will pay $137.72 and Judy will pay $179.67. It went down because the daily benefit went down and the policy lifetime maximum went down. So again, we can fit any need. Now the minimum that you can do in plan three is a $50 a day option. Why is that important? Because we can fit any need. So for $50 a day, going right here into this $54,750 is the policy lifetime maximum. So let's take a look at how much they're paying. So $45.91 is for John, $59.89 is for Judy. So again, you can fit any price point. Now, the only thing I've shared with you all right now is what we call the CPIU offers. I'm gonna show you one other offer. This one is as it pertains to John and Judy again. However, we are now looking at what we call the CPIU auto. Why is that important? This is an inflation option that will automatically increase the daily benefit and the policy maximum every single year based upon the consumer price index. So it's gonna automatically increase those benefits for an individual. Now, when it does that, this is important. It also provides what is called a partnership program. What is the partnership program? The partnership program says that if you have a long-term care policy, you have utilized every last dime out of it. 
the policy is now no longer. And you still need long-term care assistance. Usually what would happen is you would then say, okay, Medicaid, I had a policy. I have run out of money, but I still need care. Now, Medicaid has a rule. It's called a spend down rule. If you do not have a long-term care policy and you were to say, knock, knock Medicaid, I need assistance they will turn to you and say, we have to analyze what your total assets are worth because we need you to understand that we are not here to take care of your long-term care needs without you taking care of them first. So what they will do is they have a rule and the rule says you have to spend down to about $2,000 of assets. Now, ladies, gentlemen, just think about your home, your money, your retirement. If any of that adds up to more than $2,000, they're going to make sure that you spend that money down until you have reached the threshold of $2,000 before you can be approved for Medicaid to assist you with your long-term care needs. What are they telling you? We do not want you on this system. Make sure you plan. Because if you do not plan, this is our rule. Now, this is the exception here. With the partnership program, and again, the partnership program is available on an option like this, where it says CPIU Auto. What it says is I had, and here we go, $326, $310. I have spent all of it. Now, let's use some simple math. Let's just say it was $300,000. They analyze your assets and they say, okay, Joy, your assets, we're gonna say it's $500,000. So $500,000, they'll say, okay, she had a policy for 300,000. They'll say, Joy, you're gonna to have to spend down the 200,000 well, $200, They're gonna say, spend that down. You get to retain or protect or keep the $300,000, why? because your long-term care policy equated to 300,000. So we will let the long-term care policy essentially protect your assets. And again, your assets were valued at 500,000. You need to spend down the excess of 200,000, but you will get to retain 300,000. So everybody else who didn't plan has to spend down to what? $2,000. But Joy in this scenario gets to retain $300,000 of her assets. So what did she do? She protected her assets. Now I've told everyone before, if you've been on a seminar with us before or chat like this before, I purchased a long-term care policy in my 20s. Why? My grandmother is still living. She's 101. So longevity is potential at least 50% of me. So with that, and I also did it to protect assets. So I would not have to spend down and I could protect assets for what? Generational wealth, legacy building. So if you don't plan, and also what did I tell you all to start with? I wanted to capitalize on my youth and I wanted to spend less than I spend for a, for a cell phone bill is what I pay for my long-term care policy. It's pennies on the dollar and it makes sense if you understand full rounded financial planning. Don't just go in for the accumulation, the asset growth, your retirement. If you have a long-term care need, that could affect all of the planning that you have done if you have done nothing else. So remember that. Let's just simply go ahead and take a quick look here. You can see it got a lot more expensive. We saw right here to have the automatic inflation protection. It's about $583 as we shared for John and about $820 for Judy, but we don't have to do $298 a day. Let's take a look down here. The $150 a day option. Yes, it does reduce our policy maximum, but let's take a look at the amount. That's about $293 for John and about $413 for Judy. So let's go ahead and take a look at the $50 a day option. Again, that brought our 
policy lifetime maximum down to about 54,750, but the monthly premium, look at this, $97.90 for John, $137.70 for Judy. And again, these are 50 year old individuals. If you are younger than that, then it could potentially be extremely less. If you're older than that, that's okay. We'll find an option that will fit you for where you are today. Now, again, this is just hypothetical for you to get an understanding of what numbers look like. When you do a consultation, this is when your financial services representative should be diving into what you have, what you want, and how you want to see it. Let's go ahead and stop right here. We're going to go right into our presentation here just for a moment, and we're going to get right back to our hypothetical illustrations that we just did. So moving right along. We spoke about government programs out of pocket, insurance out of pocket, and insurance mix. Just understand that Medicare, a lot of times individuals will say, well, I know that Medicare, they'll cover, they'll cover my long-term care. That's not entirely accurate. They will cover up to about 100 days. If your long-term care ends up being in you're in a long-term care need for more than 100 days, now what? Okay, so now I'm gonna go through what? Medicaid, and what did Medicaid tell us? Spend down. You didn't have a policy, you gotta spend down to $2,000 worth of your assets. So clients who are getting social security coming in, you're not gonna be able to retain that social security. That has to be utilized for what? Your care needs, right? So they're going to utilize some care some monies that you have, some of your assets in order to bring you down to that amount that you are able to now be approved. Now, what happens when an individual thinks that, well, I guess my health insurance might cover my long-term care need? Well, usually health insurance will cover these, skilled or acute care which again may be a short-term treatment. We're talking about long-term care. So that's something that, again, is not going to help with that. What about if, it's, if you're re, being rehabilitated? So what about that? What about intermediate care? These things are generally covered by your health insurance. What is not covered is long-term care assistance. So long-term care, again, is not the same as life insurance, and it's not the same as long-term care disability. I get this all the time. My, my, my company, they, we have it. I have long-term care disability. And I'm like, that's not the same thing. Long-term care disability, just so you have an understanding, if you are employed and you become disabled, it can pay a percentage of your income to you. That is not the same as long-term care insurance. So just understand that long-term care disability and long-term care insurance are two completely different concepts. So what, what about this? So we talked about covering up to about 100 days. Now this was going back to Medicare. So uh, the first uh, one to 20 days are covered. Days 21 to 100 co-payment required. Anything above 100 days is not covered. And there is a wealth of stipulations as to how you are covered and if you are not covered. So don't just think that just because you say, I have a long-term care need, it's covered. They have to, in this care, Medicare has to determine if your need is one that will be covered or not. So again, who makes the call? They do. Now, again, there are strict eligibility requirements. They vary by state. Our conversation here may not pertain in New York, may not pertain in Florida, because the cost of care is different around the country, depending on where you are. Now, a lot of times people don't realize this, but again, you would get with your tax advisor because oftentimes some long-term care premiums you may receive potentially a credit. I get a statement every year. I provide that to my CPA. That is noted in when I file my taxes for the premium payments that I have made. So again, you would get with your tax advisor, discuss that. Why are they doing that? Why is there this incentive potentially for having a long-term care policy? 
It is because they are telling you, Medicare is telling you, Medicaid is telling you, we don't want you here. That is not a group that you want to belong to. They would like for you to plan. And why? If you plan, you're in control. You handle where your care will be. You determine who's coming in and who's not into your home. And on top of that, depending on the long-term care policy you have, it may cover some equipment costs in case you have to have or remodel your bathroom to be more convenient. You might need a little bit of a lift that goes up the stairs. You might have some international care may be covered depending on where you are. So again, having that long-term care policy gives you some freedom. So living a long life is a probability because we don't know how long we'll be here. Planning for it is a necessity because you don't know how long you're gonna be here. Long-term care planning creates what? A peace of mind, which is priceless. So that's one thing you wanna walk away. Now, what are the next steps? What should I do? If you've heard nothing else I have said, just remember, get in contact with someone you trust who is in the business who can assist. I am more than willing, but there are others that can assist as well. The most important factor is don't just do nothing. Get out there, have the conversation, see what you can do. Because a lot of times in my case, I'm providing a free consultation, so why not? And discuss what's important to you and your family. Most people don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. This is something I will continue to say until I can't say it any longer. It's not that the information is not out there. It's that individuals may or may not be wanting to have that conversation. But if you don't have the conversation, know that you've made a decision. And that decision is to self-fund. And if you're not going to self-fund after you try to go to Medicare and through Medicaid and the spend down rule takes place, then all the planning you just did, what happens to it? It was used for your care and you may not have enough to pass on. So the reason I'm bringing you all here is because we have this moment for you all to go right into our chat field. And what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to ask questions there and understand that there is no silly question. It's always important to understand that every question is, is, is important. And your question may be something that is burning on the mind of someone else. So if you have any questions, before we start with that, I do wanna do a very, very, very quick understanding for you. This is just something that I want you to think about. So here's what I want you to think about. If tomorrow you were to become chronically ill or disabled, who is the first person that we're to call? And I say that because if we're sitting here thinking, well, this can't happen to me, what if it does? Who is the person that you would want us to call? Two, do you expect that individual to do the following? Should they bathe you? Should they dress you? Should they feed you? Should they assist you with toileting? Should they help you in and out of a bed? Should they assist you with your continence? And on top of that, if you have Alzheimer's or dementia, should they potentially not work and take care of you full time? And three, is that individual comfortable doing all of the activities of daily living? And what would the effect be on that individual if they had to do all of that care in addition to caring for themselves? So with that shared, I wanted to leave you with that and turn this over to our questionnaire who I believe is going to be our soror Alex Duke. Yes. So looking in the chat, the first question is, does spin down apply to Medicaid or Medicare? That's a great question. So the spend down rule of that is going to apply to Medicaid. Great okay. question. Okay, so this is a follow up question. Does the spin down apply if your assist 
are in trust. Oh, assets are in trust, my apologies. No problem. So the spend down rule, what's important about that, and I forgot to mention, I'm glad that question was asked. Um, I forgot to uh, mention to you all that they also have something called a look back. Does anybody know what a look back is? So a look back, I, I see some heads nodding. A look back is, for example, let's just say an individual says, you know what, I'm smarter than Medicaid. I'm going to transfer this money over to my daughter. And they'll say, oh, well, we've got a spend down rule. That spend down rule, they can look back about five years. Now, there has been chatter that now they're looking to expand upon that, potentially higher than the five years. So what does that mean? They're looking to see where you are placing your assets. So when you have a trust and you'd have to speak with your estate attorney about that, that's where, again, your, your legal field comes in. You want to ask them that question. If I have a circumstance or a situation where I need long-term care assistance and I have money in a trust, can Medicaid come back and say, you have to utilize those assets in order to spend down? Ultimately, what Medicaid will do is they will look at your entire assets in order to calculate what you have. And they will also look to see if you had a long-term care policy in place. Now, every trust is different. So again, you'd have to speak with your estate attorney. And we had an awesome estate attorney on with our last session who is also offering uh, some consultation time. And that would be a question for them because they would want to look to see what type of trust you have and if your assets are going to be protected. But as a general rule, Medicaid will look at your entire assets, do a full calculation, and look to see if you had a partnership program long-term care policy to offset some of those assets. Thank you so much. Next question. Okay. How long would I have to pay for the policy? Oh, I love that question. So what happens is you pay on the policy for a lifetime with the exception of if you end up having a long-term care need and you are now officially, they've approved you, the premiums would stop being deducted. Now you would no longer be paying premiums and the policy would then start paying for your care need. So it should be for a lifetime up until you have an approved long-term care need, which is when the cost would then, premium cost would then stop. Uh, using your example, if John dips into Judy's benefits or uses it up, will Judy be required to start over doing blood work, et cetera, in order to purchase more insurance for herself? That's a great question. So I should clarify that John has his own pile of money. So he's got his own, own policy. Judy has her own policy. So John cannot tap into Judy's policy and Judy cannot tap into John's policy. But because of that, remember that shared care benefit that they have, there is a third policy, if you will. It's got John and Judy's name on it simultaneously, consider it like that. So either John can use that policy when he runs out of uh, long-term care benefit or Judy can use the money. Now, what happens if John completely runs out of his bucket and that third bucket, if you will, now John essentially doesn't have a long-term care policy anymore. Now what John is gonna have to do is either self-fund and if he runs out of that, then John will then go through what? Medicaid. Now they will say, how much money did John have in long-term care policies? And let's go ahead and calculate that, subtract that out. That will protect his assets if he has a partnership program policy. And then from there, they will make him spend down the rest. But that's a great question. So think of it as three separate buckets of money, three separate pools of money. One Judy, one John, and one for both of them. Great question. What happens if long-term care isn't used? 
Does the policy get passed down to other family members or children? That's a great question. Well, if it's the individual, it's only on them. So if they do not use the policy, then it does not transfer to any other individual. However, there are some rider options that most individuals do not place on this particular type of policy. It may be the ability to have a return of your monies to a beneficiary. The only thing that most people or why most people don't do it is because the cost may be as much as potentially what you're paying for, say, a mortgage. It can be pretty expensive. However, it all depends. And that's why if it's something you're interested in because you want that benefit to be able to know that, you know, if I never use this, it can potentially go back, meaning the premiums paid can be provided back, then you can place a rider that you could potentially have that option given back. It doesn't pertain on all policies. So you definitely wanna have the conversation and have the information run specifically for you. And keep in mind, there are clients who do do that because sometimes you come into a circumstance where you have an, you've received an inheritance. So now you have money you've never had before and you have an abundance of it. So it may be an option you're gonna consider because you can afford to pay for it. Now, again, having something is better than nothing. So if you can't do that option, then even a $50 a day option is better than a $0 a day option, or you're going to have to sell one. Great question. Okay. Will you be required to sell your home if the home is in your spouse's name? Um, yeah, that's the question. Okay. So, uh, so for example, if, for, if it's in your spouse's name, and when they look at assets, just keep in mind, they're looking to see how much do you own. So if it's in your spouse's name and you're not on the title of the home, it's not in your name, then that's not an asset that is considered or counted as part of your assets. Now, it could be a part of his assets. But again, if it's on, under his name, but it's your policy, we're looking at not we, but I mean Medicaid is specifically looking at what you have as your assets are, are concerned, not what somebody else has. Okay, great. Is there a minimum or maximum age and or health status to obtain LTC insurance? Yes, that's a great question. So yes, there is a minimal age. And keep in mind that the age criteria will depend. Every company is different. So I can only speak as it pertains to, um, to, to New York life in this case. So on average, and just so you know, the ages have also decreased. So you used to be at older ages where you'd see individuals that were in their 80s that could apply for policies. That has dropped down. So now it's in the 70s or so. And as far as individuals in their 20s, you definitely have to take a look at depending on where we are and depending on the state and the policy that you have. Generally speaking, you may be able to get it around 25 or so. Um, when I purchased my policy, I was in my late 20s when I got it. But I can tell you that is where it stands today. Has that number changed over the years? Absolutely. So what we are finding is because individuals are living longer, there are less companies that are in the long-term care business than used to be. It's because it is a very costly business to be in. So there are a lot of companies who have grandfathered their policies, but essentially do not offer any new policies any longer. So you want to get a policy as soon as you can, because it may not be something offered in the future or a company may not, may not uh, you know, offer it any longer. So just keep that in mind as well. Great question. Are LTC premiums generally more expensive if individuals stay at home? Since as stated, individuals tend to live longer if they remain at home. Great question. So the long-term care policy, it does not stipulate or say that if you stay at home, it will cost more. It doesn't matter if you want the care at home or at a nursing home or at an assisted living facility, the policy will be the same. 
It's just that I can tell you, depending on what state you're in, the cost of care may be different, but the policy will be the same whether you have it at home. It'll still be if you have the $298 a day option, it'll be $298 whether you're at your home, whether you're at the nursing home, or whether you're at an assisted living care facility. Now, keep in mind, a lot of times people wonder, when you say $298, what exactly are you referring to? Well, there is a cost of care. So for example, an individual may need help with bathing and let's just say eating. Now that cost may be, let's just say $25 an hour. So it might take two hours for that service. So now that's $50, right, for the day. So you had $298 a day. You only used $50 of that. So a lot of times people will tell me, well, does that mean that if you say three years, my policy will end in three years? No, your policy may essentially go on well beyond three years. It just depends on what your care needs were, which none of us know, including yourself on what your care needs are gonna be in the future. But what we do know is the cost of care, most hourly figures are ranging from $25 an hour to $70 an hour, depending on where you live. Great question. Okay. Uh, next question, um, can an individual purchase an LTC plan for their parent? Oh, that's a great, great question. So for example, the parent is who we would do the application on. That's considered the, uh, the applicant, the insured, if you will. Now an individual can be a payer. So maybe the daughter or the son is the person who is paying on the long-term care policy, but the individual is the owner of the policy, meaning the mother or the father. They are the individual who is essentially owning the policy. The policy is on their life. Now, it's a little bit different when you're talking about life insurance. Life insurance, you can be, for example, a daughter, you have a mother, you are paying on that life insurance policy for your mother, you're the owner of that policy, and your mom is the insured. Now, mom still has to go through the underwriting process, mom still has to be approved, but as long as mom, and mom signs off that she understands that there's a policy on her life, so there's no going around mom on any of that, and then once that's agreeable, then the daughter in this case could own that life insurance policy. She is basically the decision maker. Mom is just the insured. So mom doesn't have any say as to what goes on with the policy after it's approved at that point. Great question. Okay, so we're going to go backwards, um, back to the home question. Um, so on the house question, if the home is owned jointly, and the, the house is in is the spouse's primary residence. Um, is this still included as one of your assets? Great question. So now your question is asking if they the home is owned jointly. Is that what I'm understanding, Alex? Yeah, I'm I'm and believing so. I um, I think is if the home is uh, owned jointly, um, and this is considered the primary residence will this still, will this be considered part of your assets? Great question. So this is going back to Medicaid and Medicaid will determine what will be considered. But just as a general rule, they may consider that asset because if you can, if you own that and you're both on that, that's a part of your assets. I mean, you have the ability to sell that home. You have that ability to use that money in order to take care of your care needs. So it may be the primary residence, but what is Medicare looking at? They're saying to themselves, well, hold on now. If that was such a concern, then you should have gotten your own policy, but this is our Medicaid rule. So they're saying, if you wanna be a part of this Medicaid rule and you want us to care for you, then we're gonna consider all assets that are, that, are, that are belonging to you. So whatever your social is, is, is attached to, that's what they're looking at. If you've got income coming in, you've got investments, you have annuities, you've got retirement accounts, You've got, you've got equity in that home, you're a part of that home, you're on that home. They're gonna look at everything that has to do with you and make a determination. Now, if you want to know specifically what does Medicare 
require, excuse me, Medicaid require, please go on to the Medicaid specific website. You can go to Medicaid and also to Medicare to specifically find out what are their rules and it will all be listed there. Because remember, as your representative, as your financial service representative, my goal, my job for you is to get a policy that will pay for your care needs and to protect some of your assets if you choose to protect it through the partnership plan. Medicaid and Medicare have their own rules and regulations and they're best able to determine would that asset be considered and when. So same with the trust question and the mortgage question or the home question, the home property question, you want to definitely look through Medicare and Medicaid's rule. And remember, Medicaid is who is dealing with the spend down. They're looking at your assets. That is not what Medicare was doing. That was what, what Medicaid is doing, just to make sure we're clear. Okay, great question, thank you. Okay, does spend down apply to social security benefits? For example, uh, the individual is disabled while still working, uh, they are not qualified to receive Social Security because of their age. But because they are now disabled, they qualify for an increased amount of Social Security. That's a great question. Now, keep in mind, depending upon that disability, remember with long-term care, you've got to first qualify for long-term care insurance. So that individual, depending on what the disability is, I don't know if it's a physical disability or a mental disability, but depending on what it is, they may or may not be approved for a long-term care policy. So with that shared, when it comes down to if they were to go to Medicaid to assist with a long-term care need, then Medicaid would have to then determine what assets would need to be utilized for that individual's care and what they require specifically for the spend down rule to apply. So again, that is a great question, but that's really a Medicaid question because they would have to determine based upon that individual's disability, is that amount of money going to have to be factored in as part of what they have to spend in order for Medicaid to kick in and assist. So that's a great question. But again, with the long-term care question, we would have to assess that individual, review their medical records, see what that disability is. And that disability may or may not uh, qualify them for a long-term care policy. Just know that there are what is called a cognitive assessment that is often done. A cognitive assessment may determine that an individual is not able to get a long-term care policy because they are because the cognitive assessment has determined that they just don't qualify. So that happens a lot. Again, back to when you do your application, we'll determine that for sure. Really the underwriter, not myself, will determine that. Great question. Um, is there a age restriction um, to purchase a policy? And if so, what is that age? Yes, yeah, so there is, depending upon uh, what, again, back to which company you're doing with every company and every long-term care policy is, is different. But for example, between the ages of about 25 to 75 or so, you're pretty much that, that, that age range would be covered. Individuals younger than 25, not. Individuals older than 75, not. And again, depending upon the company that you're with, the policy that they offer, every policy range is different. I'm just speaking specifically about this. Great question. Okay, that's all that are, um, is in the Zoom chat. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to, oh, actually one more came in. Uh, can I purchase a policy on a special needs child? That's a great question. So this comes back to depending upon the circumstance and the individual and what's happening. So the individual would have to qualify. So in this case, depending on also the age of the special needs child. So I, if the special needs individual is, let's just say 25, okay, or older, and that, that, that age range, again, would be potentially covered. 
if it's covered, then the question then becomes, what exactly is the need? So they will go through and take a look and there are specific questions that have to be answered. Now, if there is a cognitive assessment issue, then the individual, meaning the child, let's call it an adult child, may not qualify for a long-term care policy. So that will be very, that's a great question. And that's why I would love for the individual, whomever, reach out so we can have a deeper conversation so you can fill some information in. And you can actually do an assessment prior to applying to see if it's even worth you going down that route. Because if you're not approved based upon those questionnaire, then we don't have to put you through the whole process just to get a declination. Great question. But going back to, can I purchase a policy for that special needs child? It depends. I have to say that because we still don't know what the need is. Great question. Um, that is all from the Zoom chat as of now. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Sora Joy um, to go to Facebook. All righty, well, thank you so much. You're absolutely right, um, Angelina. We've had you know, some great questions coming through uh, the, the Zoom chat. Um, thank you so much for the contribution there and you know, for sharing your insight with us. Um, I do not have any questions um, from the Facebook stream, but I do have um, acknowledgement of the importance of the topic that's been presented tonight, as well as the questions that were placed in, in the uh, chat. So thank you so very much. Thank you, wonderful. Well, with that, we are uh, going to turn that over, everything over. Thank you so much, Sora Alex, and also Sora Joy for the information provided. And now we will share and pass this along to Sora Pansy to let us know what else we need to be doing. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Sora Angelina, for the wonderful uh, presentation because I learned so much from this um, presentation. Um, thank, I wanna thank everyone for dialing in uh, and joining us uh, over these uh, four sessions. If you had the opportunity to dial in for all four or if you only um, discovered us uh, tonight, um, Thank you so much for dialing in. We truly appreciate all of your um, input uh, and your support. And we hope that this has uh, provided a seed just so you can um, be acknowledged, you can um, be informed and you can go and try to see if you need to have a free consultation or research what's going on in your life. Um, we, we just want to be uh, a support for you. Thank you again. Uh, this concludes our, our um, presentation for tonight. And uh, if you have more questions, please feel free again to, to reach out to Angelina and here are her numbers and her email uh, address as well. Um, Sarah Joy, do you have any? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you once more. Um, I just wanted to just share a reminder, please, that Fairfax County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, we provide this info as a resource, um, but want you to be mindful that we do not necessarily endorse any business as a part of these presentations. So I um, just wanted to, to share that as a reminder. Also, if you would please be so kind as to take a look in the chat, there is an evaluation that we would like for you to take a moment to fill out uh, because we'd like to know just how we did this evening, whether or not this information has proven to be useful uh, to you. Uh, we you know, only can learn and improve with the feedback that we receive. So we would um, appreciate it if you would take the time to fill that out prior to your departure. Um, we also wanted to mention again, as, as um, Sora Pansy said, stated that this concludes um, this installment or this series. Um, however, you know, please, um, um, look out for any upcoming events as it relates to um, anything that Fairfax County Alumni Chapter might be um, hosting in the future. 
please um, tune in or visit our chapter website. Also our social media pages. You can find us on both Facebook and Instagram um, for um, just to see what we're going to be up to in the coming uh, months, which leads me to uh, Sunday, this weekend. Um, we are sponsoring or hosting our May Week uh, program on this Sunday, May 23rd at 2 p.m. It is going to be a virtual event. It is via Zoom. Uh, registration is required, and we are so pleased that we are going to have with us um, our speaker for the event is Reverend Siobhan Arline Bradley, who is the chair of Delta Sigma Theta Sororities Incorporated, our National Social Action Commission. So we hope that you will be able to join us for this event to hear some inspiring words um, as we are walking in the midst of phenomenal women. So please, um, as mentioned, you'll need to register for the event, but we hope to have you join us. And um, with that, I am going to ask um, you know, our president, Sora Simmons, if you would please close us out this evening. And I thank you so very much. So, so just before we do that, I'm sorry. I think Alex may have noticed it too. Our, um, the, uh, the form. I think it was, yeah, the evaluation form was going to the estate planning. So I, I think there might be another one we need. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll take awesome. care of that. Thank you so thank much. Sora so Simmons, when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank you all uh, for joining us tonight and to thank the Financial Fortitude Committee who has done an excellent job this year providing us all with this information over these four uh, sessions. And I certainly have learned a lot. I've made some appointments myself, so it's time for us all to get our house in order. So thank you all for joining us and thanks again to the committee for all of your hard work. And good night. And, and thank you for that information. And what we'll probably do is send out a link uh, by email tomorrow or sometime this weekend to get that evaluation. Alrighty. And if the Financial Fortitude Committee could please stay on, that would be wonderful. We thank you all. Everyone have a good night. Please continue to be safe. Thank you. Let me kick the second Lenore out. She does. She shouldn't be here. And then we can stop recording as well. Thank you. You're welcome.